Good morning. I've been given the privilege to introduce uh, or maybe reintroduce uh, our speaker to you this morning, Rusty Hills. Uh, Rusty was born and raised in Corinth, Mississippi, and attended Freed Harbin University with a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's of ministry in 2001. He is married to Andrea Hills for 23 years. Uh, Andrea is a high school English teacher and they have three children, a son Tyler who is 18 years old and twin daughters Ashley and Allie who are 16 years old. They were unable to be uh, here this morning but they are traveling here tomorrow morning and will be with us tomorrow night so we are thankful for that. Rusty has been involved in full-time ministry for over 22 years working with congregations in Mississippi, Tennessee and Alabama and the reason so many of you are familiar with him uh, is that he worked with the church here in Portland uh, at the Portland Church of Christ from 2004 to 2012 and is currently the pulpit minister for the Chase Park Church of Christ in Huntsville, Alabama. His theme for uh, our gospel meeting is cultural Christianity. If you missed Bible class this morning, it should be online uh, sometime later today. The lesson was who's in charge and the lesson of the hour is, has God been canceled? Uh, so we will hand it over to Rusty, and, and we trust that our faith will be enriched. It was March of 2004 uh, when we moved into the house here on the property next door and, and began working with the church here. Uh, Tyler was one year old and the girls had not even been thought of yet at that point, but soon were, um, as you know. And uh, I, I believe this, and, and uh, Jared mentioned this in his prayer this morning, and I believe that, uh, that God certainly had a hand in us being here. That's the only explanation I can come up with uh, for how we made our way from Corinth, Mississippi to Portland, Tennessee. I hope that during the eight years that we were here, uh, we were in some way a, a blessing to this congregation, but I know for sure that you all were a blessing to us, and we are so thankful for the relationship that we continue to have with you and, and for the time that that God allowed us to, to spend with you uh, during those years. Uh, you will see uh, tomorrow, and, and Honor and the kids have been up here uh, occasionally and uh, uh, more than I have, but uh, you will see that our children aren't hardly children anymore. Tyler will be entering college this fall, and the girls are 16, and um, they're, they're fun. Uh, so <clears throat> we are uh, having a... And we're living the life in Huntsville and, and are staying busy and, and things are going well for us. And I'm, I'm thankful that uh, things seem to be going well for you all. As I mentioned this morning in uh, our Bible class period, we're thinking this week about this theme of cultural Christianity. Uh, honoring Christ while overcoming culture. And let, let me say this, and I, I don't want to come off as having a, a, a really, really negative down on the world view of, of our culture or, or of the place uh, that we live in this world. I, I don't. I, I think that it's a, God has blessed us so richly, uh, not only with a, a beautiful world to live in, but with a world that is, is really in, in so many ways so very comfortable and, and easy to live in. Uh, we have uh, so many things at, at our disposal and at our fingertips. You know, if you have a, a cell phone, a, a smartphone, you have the world literally in your hand. Uh, anything that you want to know, want to find out, you can find out in just a matter of seconds. You can communicate in a number of different ways with anybody, anywhere. Uh, and there are a lot of things and a lot of ways in which the world in which we live is a truly wonderful and amazing world and God has blessed us greatly but that world also presents some great challenges for us uh, there are some ways in which all of the advancements that we've made and and some ways in which the uh, the changes that have taken place in our world over the last decades and and um, and such have have really created some very difficult scenarios 
for us as Christians. Uh, when we think about how we will live, when we think about who we will listen to, as we talked about this morning, when we think about uh, what our lives are going to look like and, and how uh, do we balance living in this world, in the 21st century, in the American culture, with being a child of God. And how do we make those two work together? Because we, we have to, don't we, in, in, to some extent. Uh, we don't have a choice about the world that we live in. We live in this world. We're surrounded by it. And yet we have also made a very important choice, and that choice is to commit our lives to Christ and to live in a faithful relationship with Him. And, and how do we put those two things together? This morning as we study for, together for a few minutes, I want to think about, uh, and we're going to think about several different phrases that have become popular in our world and, and that you hear of that maybe a decade ago or two decades ago had never entered your mind. But one of those is cancel culture, right? You've heard that term, cancel culture. We live in a cancel culture. What does that mean? Well, it means that, uh, that, that anything that we don't like, anything that offends us in some way, we're just going to cancel it. And we have seen example after example after example of maybe... Uh, uh, people on television, celebrities on television, for instance, who have made some kind of comment, and it may not even be anything that they made, a comment that they made uh, today. It may be something that they said 20 years ago or 30 years ago when they were a teenager. But somehow it's found its way back into the mainstream, and, and because that, that statement offended the wrong people, that person has been canceled, and careers have been destroyed, and lives have been destroyed. Uh, because of cancel culture. If we don't like something, we just get rid of it. Well, along those lines, I want us to think this morning about the question, has God been canceled? Has God been a victim of cancel culture? And you can look at examples maybe in uh, in. Our world, for instance, many of you, some of you who are uh, a little bit older than I am, uh, remember maybe back in, in school, and, and I'm talking about a, a public school setting where there was uh, some scripture, maybe memory verses, things that the teacher or that the school felt like were profitable to people and, and to life in general, and so they had you read or, or memorize scripture. Or, or maybe the idea of prayer in school, that's still one that we're debating and, and thinking about and talking about. And, and we've taken all of that out of, of our, our public school systems and we've said that God has no place in public education. And so and we've, we've come to other places where you know, there, there are people who are, who are uh, desiring maybe to have uh, the, the slogan or the phrase, In God We Trust, taken off of American Currency. Or maybe we think about the idea that there shouldn't be prayers in uh, the, the houses of Congress anymore. Or some of those kinds of things. Is all of that indicative of God being canceled from our culture? I want us to think about that for a few minutes this morning. And uh, just to, to kind of further think about uh, our culture and where it, where it is today and, and where we fit within it. So uh, a couple of things to, to think about uh, as we begin. First of all, in understanding what cancel culture is, according to dictionary.com, cancel culture it could be defined as the phenomenon or practice of publicly rejecting, boycotting, or ending support for particular people or groups because of their socially or morally unacceptable views or actions. And so some person or some group does something that is seen as unacceptable uh, by another group or by, by society in general, and so that group is canceled. I like this, this statement made by Wes McAdams. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's a brother in Christ, a preacher in the... Uh, in, in the great state of Texas, and uh, he, uh, he uh, does a lot of, of writing and, and speaking and podcasts and those kinds of things. And, and Wes, uh, in trying to explain or define 
cancel culture said this, it is attempting to permanently and publicly discredit someone for words or actions that violate core values of the community. Here's the interesting thing about that statement as I think about it. and The question I ask is, who determines the core values of a community? Who determines that? In a community like Portland, Tennessee, who determines the core values of Portland, Tennessee? Who determines the core values of, of the United States of America? And the reality is that there is typically a very small and yet very influential group of personalities that will affect and will determine and define the core values. The media has a big hand in that in this country. Or maybe celebrities, people who have uh, a, a camera uh, to look into and a microphone to speak into and, and a, a voice and a platform uh, that, that allows millions of people to hear what they say. And those individuals uh, oftentimes define or, uh, the, the moral values, the acceptable views of a culture or of a society or of a community. And a lot of times you and I feel completely powerless to affect that. And we hear people say, well, you know, our society views things this way, or, or this is what is acceptable, and you and I are sitting there listening to that thinking, no, it's not. That, that's not what I believe at all. That's nowhere close to what I believe. Has God been canceled from our society? Who is responsible for making those decisions? One other uh, statement here. This is Urban Dictionary. If you know what Urban Dictionary is, it takes these, these kind of these modern uh, cliche type terms and, and I, I'm constantly amazed that, that my children, 18, 16, you know, they, they're always using these, fra these terms. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? And every week there are new terms, there are new words that they use. And I'm like, I don't understand what you're saying. It's like you're speaking a different language, but it, it's just these, these things that, that teenagers come up with. Uh, to describe certain situations or people or whatever. And Urban Dictionary is committed to, to defining all those for those of us who aren't part of that, uh, uh, that culture, the young, you know, teenage culture or whatever. Uh, the thing about Urban, Urban Dictionary, I like, a, like Wikipedia, for instance, it, uh, everything is, is submitted by individuals, and so there's no real authority behind it. You understand that. But I, I really like uh, what Urban Dictionary says about cancel culture a modern internet phenomenon where a person is ejected from influence or fame by questionable actions it is caused by a critical mass of people who are quick to judge and slow to question it is commonly caused by an accusation whether that accusation has merit or not it is a direct result of the ignorance of people caused uh, by communication technologies outpacing the growth in available knowledge of a person. And so what Urban Dictionary is saying is this, this whole concept of cancel culture is really not legitimate. Uh, but it is based on, on what a particular group of people want and, and allegations that are made that may or may not be true and, and ignorance because uh, our ability to transfer information has outpaced our... Uh, the available information or knowledge. And so cancel culture is maybe a problem. But we're not really thinking uh, about cancel culture itself this morning as much as we're thinking about God. And has God been a victim of that? And by the way, I was thinking about this. Cancel, while the term cancel culture may be new, uh, the term may be new, the concept is not. And Jesus Christ was a victim of cancel culture. Uh, he was a victim of a, a Jewish culture in the first century who did not want to believe in him because he didn't fit their preconceived image. He, he didn't look like they thought he was supposed to look. He didn't act like they thought he was supposed to act. He didn't fit the mold that they thought he was supposed to fit. And so they canceled him, very literally, through his death. And so cancel culture is nothing new. And our culture uh, is currently attacking God and Christianity and the church. Why? 
What is it about you and about me as Christians that, that has caused our society to look at us and say, you need to go away. You need to be canceled. The things that you believe in, the things that you live, I think most of us as Christians think, you know, we're, we're pretty good people, right? We're moral people. Uh, we, we don't cause a lot of trouble in our, in our communities as far as, as, as you know, breaking laws and, and uh, being uh, troublesome to the authorities. We try to be helpful to people who are in need. We try to be kind. We're pretty good people. So what is it about the church, about Christians, that has caused so many in our culture to say, you need to be canceled? Well, there are a few things. Think about, for instance, the fact that you and I uphold a certain moral value. We believe, for instance, in, in the, the sanctity of, of marriage. We believe in, in sexual purity outside of marriage. Uh, we believe uh, that life matters, and, and that'll be on the screen in a minute. Uh, but we believe that certain activities and certain uh, lifestyles should be stayed away from because they are, uh, by God's definition, immoral. And so many of those, those ideas and beliefs become offensive to people who, who embrace those very concepts. People who don't want to uh, consider marriage to be a, a holy thing. People who don't want to think about sexual purity as being something that, that is a good thing and a positive thing and a needed thing. People who want to be involved in immoral activity our upholding of those high moral values is a problem for them. Or maybe it's the defending of God's design for marriage. And I'm not only talking here about the idea of marriage being uh, forever, as we talked about in the last hour, but, but the idea of marriage being between one man and, and one woman. And there are all kinds of different concepts today of what marriage can look like or maybe should look like and that would differ greatly from, from my view and your view of marriage and, and more importantly from God's view of marriage. And so our defending of God's design for marriage is, is an issue sometimes. The sanctity of human life, especially of unborn human life. The idea that, that we, we should not have the right or the authority, or the power to decide whether a child is born into this world or not, based on our own selfish needs and desires. That's a problem for a lot of people that we hold that view. What about the defending of God-defined sexual and gender roles? This idea of gender roles, I saw some things on the news this morning even about uh, some some protests and riots and and some things that are that are happening you know even today uh, concerning this this whole gender issue and transgenderism and and you and I would say there is a a God defined uh, design for those things and, and our view of that is a a problem an issue for many in the world or or maybe it's the fact that you and I understand something about accountability. And we would suggest and we would believe and we would tell others, hey, there is a judgment that is coming. That there is an accountability for the decisions that we make in life and for the way that we live our lives. And God ultimately is the judge. He is sovereign in his rule. And what he says goes and whether I choose to believe it or not, whether I choose to accept it or not, there will come a day when God's rule will be the rule. A lot of people don't like that idea. And so for, for these and, and maybe a lot of other reasons, many in the world will say, you, Christians, need to be canceled. I, I think about my kids, and I think about some of the, these kids that, that I knew when they were much younger, and I think about how difficult their world might be in a few more years. And, and I, I hope that I am, I am wrong about this, but I fear 
that the church in America is going to begin to see uh, what real persecution looks like uh, in the not too distant future. And because of cancel culture. And because of the idea that if you don't agree with me, you need to go away. So, as we think about that, I hope you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope you'll turn with me to, to some of these passages. How? Uh, we've looked at why. All right, Why does, does the, the culture that we live in often attack the church? That's what we just looked at. Well, what about how? How are... Uh, does the church come under attack? How do Christians in their lives come under attack from, from the culture that we live in uh, sometimes? Well, a, a few things, and we find these in Scripture. Again, there's nothing new under the sun, and, and uh, there are often times when, uh, when we, we see the same things happening in a first century world that the, uh, the, the biblical writers are talking about that are happening today. It's amazing to me uh, how well... First century biblical writers describe the 21st century world. Because while the culture in, in many ways has changed, uh, there are a lot of things that haven't. And there are a lot of similarities. So, first of all, how does culture attack the church? With negative thoughts and attitudes. Have you ever been looked down on? Have you ever been at work, maybe, or at school, young people? Or on a ball team that you're a part of, or, or in some, some social circle, or maybe in your neighborhood? Have you ever been looked down, oh, you go to church? Oh, oh you go to that church? And, and you're looked down on because that automatically puts you in a certain category in people's minds. And they have a negative view of you and of your life and how you're going to react to them and how you're going to judge them because you have a certain set of beliefs as a Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4, I mentioned this verse in the lesson earlier, but in regard to these, Peter says, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. You mean you don't? do that you mean you, you don't use this kind of language if you were to speak up to to maybe somebody at work and say hey you know I, I really I'm really uncomfortable with with the, the language that this you're using and I would appreciate it if, if I, you know when when we're speaking if you would kind of try to refrain from that you mean you don't use those words you mean you, you don't you don't talk like that everybody talks like that why don't you talk like that you mean you don't go out on the weekends and, and get drunk and party? You mean you don't want to be a part of that? They think it's strange that you do not run with them in those same things. That's what Peter says about so many in the world. He's talking to Christians. He says, look, you walked away from all this. You spent enough time in, in those things, and you walked away from it, and now the people of the world look at you and say, you are weird. You're different. You're strange. Why don't you live the way I live? Why don't you, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with the way I'm living? And so these negative thoughts and negative attitudes. And you might say, you know, that the old saying, you've heard this a, a million times from, from pulpits and from Bible classes. The old saying, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me, right? And we all know that's false. And we all know that words can be very hurtful. And so when people start talking in those ways toward us and they start, uh, you know, having those attitudes toward us, it, it can be effective. And it can cause us to say, you know what, maybe I just need to not, not say anything. Maybe I need to, to try to blend in a little more. Maybe I don't need to be so outspoken with, with what I understand and know to be right. Negative thoughts and actions can affect us. Well, what about slanderous accusations? There are a lot of words that are, are thrown around in our world today that are targeted at Christians. Uh, you know, it, it can be anything from, uh, you know, and this is not a phrase maybe that's, that's still used or is still popular in our world, but uh, uh, some of you will recognize the idea of a goody two-shoes. A goody two-shoes means you don't do all the, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't cuss. 
you don't whatever, right? That, that, a person who kind of thinks they're too good for all of that. Or, or, you know, you're holier than thou. Or, or maybe in, in the world that we live in, we, we, we uh, hear terms like homophobic. Or you're prejudice. Or you're a bigot. And those, those accusations are, are given because you and I hold to beliefs and to moral standards that, that are not our own, but, well, that are our own, but are, our own, but are ours because they were first God's. Because God said this is what is right and this is what is wrong. And we give ourselves to that mindset and we give ourselves to that faith and to that belief. And so we hold those standards and for that, there are sometimes those slanderous accusations that are thrown toward us. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, we read, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. The Gentiles simply means unbelievers. All right, think of it as, as the unbelievers. Those who, who live in the world who are not Christians. Having your honor, uh, conduct honorable among unbelievers. That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, I talked about it before. You and I would look in the mirror and, and say, you know, I'm not an evildoer. I am a good person. I love everyone. I'm concerned for the souls of everyone. I want to be kind and, and respectful. I want to help those who are in need. I want to uphold those high moral values in my own life. I don't want to do harm to anyone. I want to obey the, the authorities and respect the law of the land. And, and I am a good person. And yet, Peter says, there are those who are going to speak against you, even in that life, as evildoers. Because you don't accept the form of immorality that they've chosen to live. Or you, you think differently about God or, or about marriage or about some other issue. Slanderous accusations. Thirdly, we think about maybe the use of powerful influences. Paul, in writing to the Ephesians in, in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 12, says this about Satan. And his uh, attack on, on God's people. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Here's what Paul is saying there. He's saying that, that Satan is our enemy, ultimately. But Satan will use some very powerful forces in our world as his tools and as his weapons. And so whether it is, uh, a, it is laws that are passed that would say you can't do certain things. For instance, the lesson that I'm, I'm planning to present tomorrow night, Lord willing, is a lesson that I, I fear in another five years may be illegal to preach. Things that, that are uh, labeled as hate speech. Uh, things that are, are labeled as being uh, discriminatory uh, because they point out the, the rightness of God's way versus the wrongness of the world's thinking. And, and laws that are passed to prevent people like me or Sean from standing in positions like this and telling a group of people that something is wrong, that God says something is wrong, or that prevent you from going to your workplace or in your neighborhood talking to a neighbor about the same things. Powerful forces. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier in, in the, the Bible class lesson about influencers. 
influencers or, or anybody from celebrities to sports figures to politicians to, you know, the newest thing is these individuals who have, have and this is the craziest thing in the world to me, who have made millions and millions of dollars and have become famous because of these silly little videos that they make in their lives where they're pranking someone or whether they're just showing this, this thing about their life and they put it on TikTok or they put it on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube and they are all automatically multimillionaires with millions of followers and they are considered influencers. Powerful forces that dictate what is appropriate and not appropriate and Satan will use those forces to attack us as Christians. One other thing here, and that is sometimes punitive actions where maybe a local government, maybe a, the federal government, or, or maybe just an organization will bring punitive actions against a group. For instance, and, and I'm just going to, this is not a real scenario, this is theoretical, but say you have uh, say that, that uh, there's a, a church, a local congregation of the church in a particular town, and, and they want to have a, a, a big meeting, right? And so there's a, a, a venue in town that they can rent out that has a lot of space, a lot of seating, and, and they've done this, maybe they've done this for five years, and every year they have this meeting in this big building, and they use that building, and, and man, they have a great meeting every year, and lots of people from the community attend, and lots of goods being done. But someone decides that what they're teaching doesn't need to be taught in this community because it goes against those social norms. Not that they're teaching anything immoral, not that they're teaching anything that's wrong, biblically speaking, but maybe they're teaching against certain lifestyles or certain attitudes and all of a sudden the organization that controls that that uh, venue says you're not allowed to use this uh, facility anymore and, and this event that's been going great and has grown and grown over the years all of a sudden has has kind of been stopped in its tracks by this punitive action by some group saying, because you do this or believe this or teach this, we're not going to let you use our facility any longer. It happens. And any of these things can, can be part of the attack on the church. Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. You and I, in the culture and in the, the nation that we have been blessed to live in, really don't know what that means. Now, you, you can say, and, and there are forms of persecution that we maybe deal with. You know, there, there are things that, that happen in our lives that, that we think, man, you know, that, that, that's hard because I'm a Christian, I'm trying to do right, and, and my, my workplace, you know, won't let me bring a Bible to work, or, or, or uh, they won't let me talk about Jesus in the break, break room. Or I can't pray in school anymore. And that, to us, that, that's our form of persecution. We don't know anything about being imprisoned or beaten or killed. But Paul says that, that if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, there are going to be negative consequences in this world of that. And we have to be prepared for that. So how do we respond? How do we respond to cancel culture? Very quickly, I want to run through these. One, don't be like them. And, and I don't mean simply, I, I mean more maybe than, uh, than just don't have the same beliefs as them. You know, don't be like them from a moral standpoint. But I also mean by this, don't demonstrate the hatred that so many in the world will demonstrate toward you. Don't demonstrate the, the mean-spiritedness that so many in the world will demonstrate toward you. They may treat you badly, and they may hate you, and they may cast those accusations against you, and they may try to punish you in some way. 
what does Jesus say? Turn the other cheek? Go the extra mile? Love those who hate you? Be kind to those who treat you badly? In Titus chapter 3, Paul there writes, remind them to be subject to rulers and to authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also foolish and disobedient and deceived and serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And so Paul in, in this instruction says, be what you know God wants you to be. Don't display the same attitudes of malice and of hatred and of dislike and of unkindness to those who are spewing those things towards you as Christians. Don't be like them. Secondly, don't be caught off guard. Remember that, that statement that, Paul, uh, that Peter makes in 1 Peter chapter 4. They think it's strange. Don't think it's strange that they think it's strange. Don't be caught off guard by the fact that there are going to be people that don't like the way you have chosen to live your life. Don't be caught off guard by the fact that people are going to call your morality immorality. And, and they will. Don't be caught off guard by the fact that, that people will judge you because you have stood up for what you know to be right. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Again, Peter uses that same phrase, but in a different place here. Don't think it strange. Concerning, he says, the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. We rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, and when, or that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you, on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Don't be caught off guard by the fact that there are those in the world who will dislike you simply because you wear the name of Christ. Thirdly, respond in this way. Have a different mind. I'm not going to dwell on that one because we talked about it earlier this morning. Have a different mind. Be transformed. Think differently than the rest of the world. Romans 12 in verse 2. Fourthly, pursue righteousness. What does that mean? In very simple terms, it means keep doing the right thing. Keep doing the right thing. Don't let people who are determined to do the wrong thing it pressure you and influence you to join them. Keep doing the right thing. Pursue righteousness. We read in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, test all things, hold fast what is good, and abstain from everything that is evil, from every appearance of evil. And so while the world might say this is what's good and this is what's good and this is what's good, what God says to you is test all things. Test it how? Test it by the Word of God. What does God say about that? What does God say about that activity, about that attitude, about those, uh, that lifestyle? If it is good, great. Hold on to it. Do it. Live it. But if it is not... If it is something that God says is not good for you and that is not pleasing to Him and that is not His will for you and your life, then abstain from it. Stay away from it. Continue to pursue righteousness. And then, lastly, have a right spirit. Listen to Paul's exhortation to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What does it mean to have a right spirit? I think in one sense it means to not cower in fear in the presence of our enemies. To not cower in fear because some one or some group or some position says you need to think a certain way and act a certain way and you need to quit doing the things that you're doing. Don't cower in fear because someone doesn't agree with what God says is true. Don't cower in fear because someone wants to judge you and, and to accuse you of wrongdoing because you stand up for what is right. Continue to be right. 
And, and you can do that with love and you can do that with kindness and you can do that with gentleness, but continue to be right. Have the right spirit. A spirit of power. A spirit of love. A spirit of a sound mind. Has God been canceled? There certainly are attempts within our, our culture to do just that, to cancel God. Certainly, hopefully in your life, God is alive and well. God has not been canceled. Hopefully in your life, He continues to, to rule. He, he continues to be the thing that you focus your life and your faith on. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we read these words, I urge you, in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Jesus Christ, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality dwelling, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no, one, no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. In the text that was read before the lesson from Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about a culture of people who, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts, in their, in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They took God, and they put Him in a closet, and they canceled Him. In this text, Paul reminds us in his writing to Timothy that our Lord is sovereign, that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that it is not within man's ability to cancel God. That he is alive and well. And will continue to rule. Whether men want him to or not. And God is sovereign. The question of whether or not God has been canceled is in some ways a cultural question. And in some ways it is a personal question. Because I have to decide about my life where God will fit. Will I put him in the closet and, and cancel him in my own life, at least when I'm cer around certain places or in certain situations? Or will I continue to allow him to reign and to show and to let my light shine for him in this world? Where is God in your life? What is your relationship with him? Has God been canceled can be a very personal question. And so as the, the invitation is extended this morning, and as you think about that relationship that you have with God, where is He? Where have you placed Him? Has He been canceled? If you have a need to respond to the invitation this morning, uh, we certainly pray and, and hope that you will, and that uh, we, can, uh, we will have the opportunity to pray for you and with you, and to encourage you and to help and assist you in any way that we can. If you have any need this morning, we hope that you'll come as we stand and as we sing.